Well, that's fast. It's, it's gone. Okay, ready? Yep. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 95. And we just have a ton of news. And I know that last week we didn't record, so we got to make up for last week's news with more news. And there was a lot and a lot and a lot of news. So, Tom, you want to just jump right in? Sounds like a plan. I mean, I think we should start. I don't know if we should start with it, but I'm going to. We should start talking about how LastPass was acquired by uh, Log Me In for. Yes. I think I don't want to say a lot of money, but I'm sure they're they're very much well off. Uh, it, it was a decent amount of money. Um, it's it's really worrisome. Um, if ever there was a time to disable comments on a corporate blog, that was it. Um, so so I read the article. Did you see the comments? I just I kept hitting F five. I was like, this is entertaining. Yes. No. The comments were were very. I, Log me in is not a positive thinking company. No, not at all. Where LastPass is. We, we, we do like LastPass, and it's just log me in is just, it's just Lasai. I Log me in has got a, what I'm really afraid of is log me in has got this horrible tendency to take great software, great products, great companies, and utterly, brutally murder them just slowly over a period of years. Um, Himachi used to be this great, you know, Himachi great, was awesome. Cr- awesome. Great, like this tiny little uh, pseudo VPN, pseudo LAN thing across the internet, so you and your buddies could play games together, LAN games across the net. It was just rad. It's a way to get just far away computers on the same virtual network. Oh, so powerful, so awesome, easy to use, fast and simple. Yeah, Log me and acquired them, and then over, I, I want to say about a year. Um, log me in just added bloat and bloat and bloat and then made the product harder to use and then made it super expensive and took away great free features and it just a and brutal the price. nasty murder it they was made awful. It paid and then paid became uh, some like donation where then it be- then it got merged yeah. into their enterprise service so basically it priced everyone out. And yeah. it, like you said, it was bloat. It was great. You little. It was a little thing, and and then it got big. Yeah. So. Yeah, be, and, being acquired by Logman is not a good thing if uh, if you care about your software at all or your users. Was Logman PC anywhere? Um. It, it, that's no, a blast of the past. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, look. Uh, and we're not talking and look last pass is it, look if, if somebody came to us and said we're going to offer you a lot of money to do a podcast for them i don't know i i don't know what the answer was i don't think that they i'm sure they went there and they were told you're going to keep full autonomy you're going to do everything that you're going to keep on doing we just want to have a little icon at the bottom that's probably going to go for the the golden handcuffs of two years and then we're going to see from there so right. for right now we we have some time. You have an you have a you probably have a year or two. I hope. Um, I, I do know that uh, Logman did acquire another password manager right. that was liked by a lot of people, and they just ruined it. Uh, I want to say it's been about a year since they got acquired, and it's just trash now. It's almost unusable. So, um, it, it it was really sad. So I was I was going through the hacker news comments, uh, which is it's kind of like Reddit, except for way more technical people. With Reddit, you'll get a lot of people making jokes and posting memes, and you know generally trying to be funny and make everything a laugh. And on hacker news, it's a more uh, mature, serious, you know, programmer level discussion on events, and everyone there was just. I really bummed out is the best way to describe it. No one wanted to see this. You know, LastPass getting acquired, that's great. That's awesome for them. Congratulations, guys. You made an exit. Hopefully you made some money. But could you have sold to literally anyone else? Anyone else would have been better than Log Me In. Well, never say never. I, I hate when people <laughs> say that. But, yes, you know, there, there are some pretty bad companies there. But, anyway... You're right. We we really we, we do wish them well, and if you're using LastPass now, feel free to continue using them. 
And we'll, we'll be here to t- hopefully we'll still be a lot here telling you when maybe you should migrate off some. Yeah, point. I I would. Uh, I, I'm going to offer a piece of advice, which I've been telling everyone I've been telling to use LastPass for the past forever. Um, use the export function now. Um, make sure to encrypt the file. You can use something like 7-zip and click the encrypt button, put in a really strong password there. Um, because I don't know if Logman is going to take away that functionality. Uh, and being able to take your data out of LastPass is one of the best features they have. So make use of it while it's still around. Again, I don't know if they're getting rid of it, but you don't want to take the chance. These are your passwords we're talking about. And the secure notes and everything else. Yep. And so I think this is going to lead us into our first story. And I only know very little because my eye, my eyes glazed over when I heard the technical details. But it involves a competitor. So everyone's asking us, what's the competitor to LastPass? And everyone's going to, you're going to hear 1Password mentioned a lot. And I have issues with 1Password for many different reasons. One of them being they don't want to offer two-factor because they don't think it's necessary. Not a, we're turning it off by default, you have to turn it on. But no, we don't want it because we don't think we need it. They did something with their file format, which basically, for convenience, allowed you to access your password. So you put your password lock or whatever in Dropbox or Google Drive or some sort of cloud service. But if you've completely lost your ability and you need, you're on a computer, you can't install stuff in, you go there and you're able to view the websites that you have passwords for. And right. that's a problem. Basically, a metadata leak. Yeah, and and while that doesn't sound bad, like you know, you're you're probably thinking, well, what does it matter if you know my list of sites that I have passwords for gets out? You know, everyone goes to Twitter, or Facebook, Google. You know, who cares? Um, well, if your password vault contains stuff like work passwords, uh, maybe you manage a family blog that you log into uh, that has you know the personal information on it that you don't want being public public I mean you did put it on the net but still um, yeah there's there's a lot of really good social engineering that can happen when someone knows exactly the websites you visit commonly enough that they're in the password manager plus if like you said you're saying the good things but what happens if it's a website you don't necessarily want people to know that you visit there's that too and and with that and so while it sounds Here's the issue. It's not that it sounds a little weird, like, okay, this is an oops or whatever it is. They're defending it. They're defending the convenience of it. And that was my issue with two-factor. They keep on going back to, we did it this way because we think this is the right way. Rather than LastPass, which has all these other things that say, hey, look, we're, we're trust no one. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. We believe it this way. Ask us questions. We'll answer them for you, and we'll be brutally honest with it. And if we think that you're right, we have no problem changing the idea. Right. Yeah, it's it, LastPass seemed to have uh, a, a more humble air towards their product and what they're building. I, I don't like personalizing companies because I, I think it's it leads down a really inaccurate path of how companies work. But uh, what I get from all of... One password's kind of retorts to these questions that that people keep asking is, it, it almost seems arrogant. <coughs> uh, it almost seems like you know it, we're doing it this way. It's the right way, and we're never changing it because we're right all the time. There's there's no back and forth. There's no argument. There's no civil discourse about any issues, and that's that eh, kind of put me off. Um, I, I know for for me, uh, I moved to. KeePass. I, I moved to the open source solution to store my passwords, and yeah, it's it's kind of annoying. It's definitely not as easy to set up as LastPass, uh, but once you get it going, all the features are there. Well, and that's the problem. It's the friction. You're going to be in LastPass, and you're already paying twelve dollars, and log me in and say, hey, well, for. $15 a year the first year, and then it starts to 20 Then it gets merged into their ultimate password solution. It, it, it's a thing. So we're looking. Uh, if you want to go the one password route, it's $40 a year. Or no, no, I'm sorry. $40 one time on the machine that you use. So PC. If you're on a Mac, it's also $40, but you don't get the one license. And then you got to buy it for each phone. 
So you you have to put three years in and you'll get it back. And look, people really like it. It is really shiny, but they have these little issues. So if you're okay with that, it's a fine choice. And then you have Dashlane, which is something like $40 a year, or you can go KeePass, which is a USB stick on it, and you have to deal with that. Well, actually, uh, with, with KeePass, what you can do um, is – if you're using something like, uh, you know, you've got a key file, don't only use a key file, but use a key file and then use a really strong password, just like you used for LastPass, because it does the same thing. That one password is the key to your whole castle. Um, so, you know, use a key file, use a really good password, and then take your, your password database and chuck it up to Google Drive, to Dropbox, to Own Cloud, to OneDrive, to whatever online cloud storage you're using, put that up there because the thing's encrypted. It's an encrypted blob of data. It's like, if you're feeling really paranoid, throw it all in a TrueCrypt or Veracrypt volume, lock that thing up and then put that in there. So now you've got the TrueCrypt stuff to break through uh, and then you've got the KeePass stuff to break through. So you can keep it synchronized everywhere, even on mobile devices with something like OneDrive or Dropbox that has mobile access um, and still have access to your passwords. So it, it does take some manual work. It's not fully automatic. It's not as shiny as LastPass. Uh, but you can emulate the same functionality. And you don't have to pay for it. And free is good. And it's verified. So there's a lot of good things about it. I'm hoping – I'm going to stay on LastPass for the time being. I'm hoping some competitors step up and say we're trying to get that business because there is a market. And those yeah. people – those commenters who are saying bad things – I bet you have paid subscriptions and they're willing to go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. The, from, from the comments on that blog post, you know, the, the I want to say about half of them were, you know, uh, Hey, it's, it's a good thing. I didn't renew my premium subscription yet because I'm leaving. Uh, and LastPass gives you the ability to export your data. So they're going to take their data and go somewhere else. So, and, and again, it's, uh, I, by the way, I did just renew my, my premium subscription, but that's okay. I'm okay right now. I'm just hoping that I get another year or two out of it before I really have to worry about it. And crossing my fingers that last that, that LogMeIn really doesn't screw it up, and they just put a little banner at the bottom. I'm crossing my fingers, but I don't know. I'm next, okay. next story. I think it's uh, the CIA director's email that's not so safe. Yeah, about this. Um, it turns out that the email servers of the CIA were brutally compromised by a t Oh, wait. It wasn't that? Hold on. I'm getting something here. The CIA director was storing important classified documents in his AOL email address. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's not really good. <laughs> um... Uh, this was fantastic. Um, so, the CIA director, hacker, oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. teenage hacker, um, went ahead and social engineered uh, a couple companies, uh, posing, I believe, as a uh, Verizon employee, um, and gained access to the CIA director's AOL account. Now, aside from the sheer embarrassment that the CIA director still uses AOL, uh, it turns out that he actually had classified documents, classified emails just sitting in there as attachments in the email. Uh, this is why you know, when, when your IT people tell you, hey, look, please, whatever you do, do not use your personal email for company stuff. Just don't do it. It's because of stuff like this. Right? Hopefully someone's not going to social engineer their way into you know, your Gmail account or your Yahoo account. But it, the idea is your IT people are going to do a better job at securing this stuff than AOL or than you. If you click on a phishing email and put in your password into a site that you know, is asking you for it. Um, yeah, this, this, is kind of, this is really a black eye. Um, it's, it's bad. Well, look, I, I'm re so I posted the New York Post link in there because now here's the problem. We're giving the New York Post a uh, Pulitzer because the, the teenage uh, hacker went there first. They could have gone anywhere. They decided to go to the New York Post first, but it didn't seem yet. It didn't seem like he was doing classified information on purpose. I mean, I only read the initial reports that he, most of it was just whatever. And then yes, every once in a while, 
we found two or three classified documents. It didn't. It, it wasn't the treasure trove I think that they were looking for. But I guess as we're getting it now, we're finding more and more. Yeah, and uh, we're actually we're gonna have a lot of stuff to go to. Uh, if you head over to WikiLeaks, they have started posting Correct. his uh, <laughs> his emails, file attachments. Uh, with all the gory details, which is searchable. Yes, it is searchable. It's indexed, it's searchable, and uh, yeah, you know, like everything WikiLeaks put out, it's pretty good quality. I, I like their website. They've got some good tech in there. And and it goes back to the problem that that well, we'll let the government handle this. Well, the government can't keep their private secrets private. Right. Uh, unless unless you're the IRS, somehow. Those emails just, they disappear, you know? That's what I don't understand. I understand. So I guess nobody's, everyone's afraid of the IRS. Do whatever you want. You want to call yourself a hacker, as long as you pay taxes, the IRS <laughs> won't bother you. But nobody seemed to hack the IRS yet. Yeah, no, not yet. Uh, but, you know, everyone who works for the IRS currently has got their fingerprints, date of birth, social security number, and any and all personal information that U.S. government has uh, is is out in the open at this point. So it's, uh, I, I don't know. It, for me, it's, it's, you're still using AOL, which is the first mistake. I get, like I said, from the initial report, it seemed like, it seemed like you did a pretty good job siloing it when you get one of those, oh, I got to send this home and look at it on the road. I can't access right. my email from my BlackBerry, so I'm going to send it here, not knowing, like, really, it's one thing, one thing there, but you're the CIA. And, and this, on. yeah, you, you expect a, a, you know, a, a higher level of, of security awareness. Um, but, you know, it, it really, if, if you take this as a lesson, if you're managing a company, if you've got... You know, if you're a manager of any kind, if especially if you work in IT, uh, users are going to do anything they can to get their work done. If that means forwarding something to their Gmail address, they're going to do it. If that means sticking on a flash something really important on a flash drive and walking out of the building, they're going to do that. Um, you know, people generally like to get their job done. Sometimes people hit really nasty deadlines and they've got to work, you know, at home or through the night and they're not going to come into the office. They they don't really care about VPNing into the system just to get access to some emails or some documents, right? They're going to walk away with it uh, on a flash drive or stick it on a, a tablet or a phone or something uh, just so they can get their job done. Um, if, if you're in IT, if you're managing this, if you have any kind of control over it, you need to give people the tools, the ability to do their job wherever they are securely. Let and me ask you will, this. That will prevent leaks like this. I, I, I wonder on an SMTP server or secure SMTP server, you can say all outgoing mail has to be like a whitelist. You cannot send outgoing mail unless it's – unless it – conforms to this whitelist and to build the whitelist you need the person needs to show their security clearance why can't is that a thing can we do that oh yeah yeah that's that's definitely a thing actually uh some companies very few but some companies actually do that now you know as someone who used to work in it directly and with users um it's very difficult it is incredibly difficult um you know i, I didn't work for a giant company it wasn't a fortune 500 company or anything it was a Decent size, but it wasn't massive. Uh, but I couldn't even begin to make that whitelist. Um, you know, with suppliers and the suppliers' vendors and the material providers and just everything involved in running the business day to day. And then, you know, not to mention all of the services companies we work with. You know, I we've got you know stuff from Amazon corporate, Apple corporate, and that's just IT side. Uh, then you've got all the HR and benefits people, you've got ADP, and they've got like a bunch of domains that they fall under. Um, you know, God forbid you work with Salesforce and you start tying into other things that branch off of that. It's a lot of work. Yes, you can do it, but that is something that needs a dedicated security team. Maybe you can get away with doing it if you're a small mom and pop shop, but for a large enterprise, you absolutely need a security team if you're going to pull off that kind of protection. I mean, it's a, good, it's a great CIA. idea, but I mean, you're the CIA. I mean, oh, I, yeah, I feel like 
I feel the like CIA, then yes, yes. Uh, you're, you, you're must. The, you, you, you have the ability. I, I have a feeling they have the ability to do something like this. Yeah. Because remember, this is the guy. This is the guy that issues directives. This is not the guy who's who's going day to day things. So he's probably just worried about his secretary is probably coming in and saying what's going on today. He's not making the hard security choices. He's just the forward facing person of the organization. He's taking the responsibility and he's not really doing much of the work. That's what this other the other people are for. Right. I'm thinking. I, I I mean, I remember the CEO of Motorola used to print a, his secretary used to print out all his emails and he would dictate the responses. Because he didn't need to be technical, he just needed to run the company. So that's one way to do it. I mean, I'm sure they changed that now when Google bought them and then sold them again, but so the next story is a little scary, and it was I, I don't remember who posted it, but the, the, the three-letter organizations are going after 23andMe saying, hey, an Ancestry.com. And they say, hey, you have a lot of, uh, of records, uh, DNA records and Ancestry records. We kind of would like to have them. Yeah. And that's a yeah. problem. This, this is concerning. Um, it's not... I hate to say this. I hate to say it's not surprising. Um, if you're, if you want DNA evidence, go to the people that have DNA, um, which is 23andMe. People, you know, uh, willingly said, "Hey, look, here's my DNA. Do some analysis on it. Tell me, you know, if I am susceptible to heart disease or Parkinson's or etc." 23andMe was a great service. It's fantastic. I do not blame them in any way because. Really, they're an innocent party in all this. They were, they had a function. They presented it to people. They said, "This is what we're doing," and they kept the genetic information not because they were hoarding information. They kept it because, as more advanced research came out, as they developed their techniques further, they could say, "Oh, hey, uh, Bob, I know you sent us, you know, this genetic sample two years ago, but." This thing came out, and we think that you know your spleen might be in trouble eventually. So here's here's this paper. Go take it to your doctor and get really checked out because we're not your doctor. Um, so, yeah, it, all the government agencies now are saying, "Huh, we would like to store that genetic material. We we would like to have you know a uh, a rap sheet on on people that have used this service uh, just for the sake of collecting it." For, for, I have a story. So recently, my wife and I were sent by our health insurance a DNA, not a DNA kit, but basically one of these things where you spit into the vial and you send it to them. It's not for any health insurance thing. It's for something else. But they uh, now we're sending it off there. So now my DNA is in some vial, which they're going to analyze and come back and say, this is what you're susceptible to. And if you want that data, they apparently they'll tell you everything. Whereas 23andMe used to be very limited, and like you said, as they're growing, they're becoming more and more. And by the way, 23andMe just became FDA approved. So you have, so now more and more people are going to do this, and you're going to be building this huge case, and I bet you that's the first place they go when they need to know information about somebody. Right. So. Yeah, this, this is very worrying, but it, it falls along, legally it falls along the same lines as, you know, the any three-letter agency going to Yahoo and demanding email or going to Twitter and demanding an IP address. They say, hey, look, here's this court order. Uh, or if, you know, they're feeling really snarky and really nasty, they go, hey, here's this national security letter. Uh, give us the information on these people. By the way, you can't tell them about it because it's an ongoing investigation. And uh, wow, for those of you listening to the audio, that was with massive big air quotes. Uh, that's usually it's it's the standard line for any law enforcement uh, trying to avoid responsibility. I just say. remember the, the courts have always said that fingerprints and DNA is easily get. I don't know. I don't know the right word. Easily gettable. So I don't know how far they actually have to go. I mean, you can be compelled. Right, and, and this this is why we we tell people, hey, um, you know, if you're gonna use a fingerprint scanner. Uh, you know, don't use your thumb. Don't use whatever primary finger that people think you're going to use. Um, you know, with the new Nexus devices, it's on the back, so don't use your index finger. Use a pinky. Use a ring finger. Use use something odd and kind of strange. That way, you can use the wrong finger, and then configure your system to lock you out after one incorrect attempt. 
Uh, because if you are taken to court, if a judge says, hey, unlock your phone, biometrics are not covered under the Fifth Amendment. Someone can force you to give DNA, hair, uh, blood, fingerprints, whatever. All of that is completely open and is considered uh, to be, you know, public information by the courts. It is not protected in any way under any law. Uh, so if you're if you've got evidence on your phone that you don't want people to get to, um, make it harder to get to by using odd biometrics or better yet, don't use biometrics at all. I don't use and will not use fingerprint sensors. And well, I mean, we argue about that for the convenience. It's awesome. I will yes. tell you unlocking my wife's iPad with my, with my not thumb finger is awesome. I'm, I'm excited about the Nexus, uh, the Nexus imprint. So for that, I'm, I'm really happy. But anyway, a couple of fun stories, and I got a story and a personal story. Target, Target, and by the way, I'm getting some of these news stories from Security Now. They, their most recent episode, they have all of this explained in really gory detail. But apparently Target was shut down because the PA system had pornographic music playing over it. And when you listen to the whole thing, the short answer is... You can call, you can not internal closed circuit, you can call a phone number to get on a store's PA system. So you pick up a phone and they say, call, uh, dial 1234 star to get on the PA system. And, and you can get on the PA system. And the idea is if you have to call out a code Adam for an abducted child, or you lost your child in the store, or you want to report a spill on aisle seven, or apparently if you want to play adult music through the airwaves. You can do that. But it took it one step further that you can remote it. Right. So and they uh, stop it. <laughs> this is why, if, if you've ever heard the term security through obscurity, uh, that's exactly what this is. Uh, this is someone saying, ah, oh, well, they'll never figure this out. So we don't have to bother securing it because, you know, who would just dial a random number? Um, yeah. For, for PA systems like this that work over the telephone system, usually you restrict it to internal calls, so this type of thing doesn't happen. If you wanted to get crazy about it, restrict it to internal calls and then require a PIN. Um, that would be awesome. Uh, but yeah, uh, so is it, it was that just for one store? Was it one store misconfigured or was No, that... of, cor of course not. It's, not just, it's <laughs> never just one store. <laughs> In this store, I, they were. I was, I was hoping. I was hoping for just, just a little bit of goodness in this. No, there was no goodness. And the funny part is, so they didn't realize that the churn rate. They never changed the number, so when the employees got let go. They still knew the number. So I mean, you work for Target for a week. You get fired for being late too many times, and now you exact your revenge by doing this. <laughs> Oh, this this actually this reminds me of a uh, of a talk. Uh, I want to say, let me see, let me make sure I'm getting this guy's name right. Um, but it's, I mean, we were able to do this at school. It was one of the things for the senior prank. They found the code because, but that was set internally. You couldn't call it from outside, and that caused some problems. But it's just so crazy that you would think that this is it. They have to enter a key combination. There should be other ways to get on the PA system. Yeah, so so this actually sounds exactly like uh, a DerbyCon talk given by Drew Redshift Porter. Um, uh, he he discussed his second vehicle where he turned his Jeep uh, into a radio collection mobile device. It was awesome. He could sniff any traffic, like cell phones, Wi-Fi, uh, whatever you can imagine. It, it looked like a ham radio car on steroids. It was rad. Um, Go check out his talk. It's on YouTube. Um, it's awesome. Uh, but he was discussing a story in this talk. Um, he was listening to airwaves, and he's like, ah, that's interesting. He was sitting by a water treatment plant, uh, just seeing what kind of signals he could gather. Ran it through some processing, and it turns out it was dial tones. Just touch tone dial tones. He's like, huh, that's odd. Uh, so... He told the water treatment plant about that, and they said, oh, uh, yeah, that's actually the code to open and close the floodgates. Um, don't dial those numbers. Apparently, you can just send these dial tones through clear text 
around this water treatment plant and the floodgates would open or close depending on which tones you you shot at it um not very secure i i would say uh they did end up upgrading that system uh but it was an old common system so uh yeah, let's let's hope that uh that those get upgraded in the future well let's look and this is why we talk about security in these talks because we're trying to force these companies that that's the issue force these companies into at least recognizing it and changing their security and then we're all safer hopefully yeah. public disclosure works so anyway we're that's our time so we're going to end now we may do another show this week so we'll put out two to make up for last week but we'll definitely let you know when that happens so until next week we will see you later